Cannon again, but he's not very quick at this time. And in 94, he crossed Castle Kennedy and stopped the Lucky Derry in Northern Ireland on the wing, and that was a journey time of an amazing one hour, 20 minutes. Now, it's pretty wet and miserable out there on the wing, I can assure you. You might be used to seeing the lovely girls from the Brighton wing walkers spinning around on their harnesses, but Tom is just firmly strapped in. Mike brings her back round now in front of you in this slightly lower power version of the Stearman. Uh, it's got uh, an increase on the original engine with a 300 horsepower load coming. And uh, giving you some feel of what it's like to be up there, Andy. Tell us all about it. Well, at least the gent, uh, the old uh, Tom Lackey there, being on the wing, I'm not really on this one for years, but uh, certainly a real weapon for record on this. I was fortunate enough to be picking up my running record, and uh, it was fantastic. And it was that you're fighting the wind, the air, the on top of the wind, it's very rare to find a piece that you can uh, Quite disconcerting, but doing uh, loop the loops and the roller coasters and up and down, up and down. My flight was practically ripped off, incredibly fatigued, 150 mile an hour winds, incredibly, incredibly hard work. Well, that would have been something to see, wouldn't it? Uh, and sounds though as if he's going to knock it off now. I think the weather is just a bit too much for him, very, very sadly. And as I say, it must be very uncomfortable as you described there, Tom. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, he's a terrific guy. He's been in the business a huge amount of time. He actually started uh, professional uh, display flying as long ago as 1986. So he's well used to sort of going around and was involved with the crunchy wing walkers for many years. Same team, of course, that Vic Norman runs as Brighton Wing Walkers now. And he left that in 2006 to run his own uh, biplane company, now called the Wing Walkers.
is uh, operated by the, uh, the armed forces. It's actually owned uh, by a civilian company, Babcock. They own and maintain this aeroplane um, and sponsor us through the display season. And uh, they also have, uh, we have one engineer, Ron Babcock, who's a part of the display team. So he travels around with us. He's at Bournemouth Airport at the moment and he uh, makes sure the airplane is ready. He'll be with us all weekend uh, preparing the aircraft, making sure it's fueled, it's got oil and it's serviceable and ready to entertain you on each day of this uh, weekend coming. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's the, uh, just adapted the display today to, uh, to stay below the cloud. Uh, we normally go slightly higher, you know, pushing um, up to about 2,000 feet, but it's staying below it. Um, so uh, just over 1,000 feet, it will be going into vertical. Oh, that looks painful. How much minus negative G is he pushing there? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, an uncomfortable maneuver. Negative 3G, he'll be hanging his straps upside down there, um, and uh, blood will be rushing into his head. It's surprising how physical this uh, actual display is. He'll, uh, when he gets back to the Bournemouth Airport, he'll, uh, he'll step out the aeroplane and be quite exhausted, ready for a uh, cup of tea to get ready for tomorrow's display. Yeah, I would say it's soaking wet, but that's actually guaranteed because all the fans are soaking wet as well today because of all the rain. But they're rushing in from that uh, from the eastern side, from the left-hand side. How much, how much speed is he picking up now? Yeah, well, as he's diving down, he's uh, converting his height into speed. He'll be uh, about 150 miles an hour there. He uh, tops us over 200 miles an hour throughout the display. That's very impressive. Now, it's not Andy's first year displaying, is it? It's not his first year. He's actually been a display pilot on two previous years, which is uh, unique for a Tudor display pilot. Um, and that actually is uh, easy to see in the way he's flying his display today. Beautifully flown by Andy, and, uh, and I try flying these maneuvers regularly, and uh, trust me, he does make it look easy. Well, clearly, a true mark of a uh, very experienced and uh, skilled display by the ability to cope with changeable conditions. So today, is that looking pretty difficult? Today's conditions are pretty difficult? Yeah, uh, something that's uh, so small and slow, like uh, this aeroplane, gets blown around quite a lot by the wind. Um, so he's having to make lots of uh, changes um, as, he, as he performs the display, so he doesn't get blown away, so he stays right in front of you. So a uh, very, very challenging uh, for Andy today, but some of Andy's calibre certainly does make it easy. Uh, pulling up the, the, that straight wing, of course, adding a lot of uh, lift and capability to that wing to make him blown around by the wind. With that speed, obviously, it makes it quite bumpy for Andy to fly in the cockpit. It is. It, he'll be uh, getting pumped around all over the place. So he dives back down now, accelerates. He'll be uh, going down to about 100 feet above the sea, about 200 miles an hour. And if you look really closely, you might be able to see him waving at you as he comes past. So look close, see if you can see him waving. If you can, give him a big wave back. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's give Andy Priest a nice big wave. It's my great pleasure to present the 2014 Royal Air Force Tucano display. <laughs> So Dave pulls up into a Canadian break to start his routine and I mentioned that uh, this is a reduced display owing to the uh, lower cloud base but uh, that in no way reduces the amount of physical effort taken to flight. If anything actually he's pulling more high G because it's, uh, this, this display flying for us today is all about uh, tight turns predominantly showing the aircraft off to best effects. Now, Dave, no stranger to a display flight, he was the Takano display team's manager this time last year. Uh, but before that, he was also, in a previous flight, the uh, C-130J Hercules role display, role demo captain, and also the captain of the uh, C-130J, which is from the Royal Air Force Falcons parachute display team. Now, Dave Fowler had a fairly uh, varied career in the RAF as well because he originally joined as a tornado navigator and then in 1999 crossed over to become a pilot and uh, spent all of his operational tour of, uh, time as a pilot on the C-130J Hercules before going to RAF Linton on Ouse near York as a qualified flying instructor about four years ago. 
Now, I mentioned the G-forces that uh, Dave's experiencing today flying uh, flying this paper, and unlike class jet aeroplanes, he's got no g pads or uh, other assistance in the cockpit to help him with sound the uh, increased G-forces. He's coming up to five times the force of gravity today, 5G, which makes every part of his body feel heavier than normal, including the blood in his head, seems to be having to strain against that increased G-force to then prevent himself from blacking out. Now the uh, short Takano T1 that we see flying for us here today has been in RAF service uh, since uh, 1988 and it took over from the venerable jet promise to the RAF's basic fast jet trainer. Now, uh, before uh, Bertie was talking to you about the uh, tutor display and uh, mentioned that uh, pilots joining the RAF, student pilots, do about 60 hours of flying training on the tutor and thereafter uh, those who are selected to be fast jet pilots come to RAF Little on Ouse, New York and they're with us for about a year. We do about 120 hours of flight training with them on the Takano, including all the disciplines, low level flying, navigation, formation, flying in bad weather and flying at night. And of course it's hard work and uh, the guys have to work very hard to pass it, but when they do, they get their coveted RAF pilot's wings and move on to RAF Valley on Anglesey, where they're now by the brand new Hawk T2 advanced fast jet trainer before going on to their front line operational type. So at the moment we're talking about things like the Tornado and the Typhoon, but in a few years time also be the brand new Lightning II, which is coming into service for both the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. training, move on to their front line types, they will be standing by as part of the UK's defence both here and overseas. And these guys will to stand by 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. balancing all three flight controls, both the ailerons, the elevator, and the rudder, to produce that nice, slick roll that... It's the rudder! Aerobatic aircraft. It's 
Now a product of BAE Systems, it's a very successful export, having been sold to 19 countries across the world. It's quite an old aircraft now, the first flight of the Hawk had its anniversary last week, in fact the 40th anniversary of the Hawk. Now looking out to the front, the smoke comes on as they reverse this shape, and we call this Flanker. Bow with the Royal Navy Bird. 
The aircraft's primary role is to hunt and, if necessary, attack hostile submarines. For this, it is equipped with specialized radar and sonar combat systems that allow it to detect, track, and destroy enemy submarines. So the aircraft now moving away from wing over out to your left hand side and positioning away from the ground. And if you're going to simulate now positioning for a running landing, this obviously maneuver that clearly we can't do here today, obviously possibly on a boat, but actually what it's intended to do is to show how it can quickly run on and take off again from for a quick disembark of either troops or equipment and for that simulated running landing, running in from your left hand side. The aircraft also hunts very effectively in the anti-surface warfare arena. To carry out these roles, it can be armed with up to four Stingray torpedoes, depth charges and a variety of machine guns. It is also very capable in the ground support or trooping role, search and rescue and casualty evacuation. designed to operate for both large and small ships flight decks in severe weather and high sea states day and night. When embarked, 829 Squadron operate primarily from the Type 23 frigate, but also can embark on all sorts of other platforms like you see in front of you here today, and included sadly the recent retirement of Illustrious, but the fleet flagship Bulwark and the newest daring class T-45 destroyers. Now moving now to the crowd front, you see it's lowered its landing gear. It's now going to move into the 20-foot hover where you'll really get to see an impressive, quite significant downwash from those huge paddle blades. Powered by three Rolls-Royce turbo mecha gas turbines, the rugged airframe is constructed mainly of composite material. The main and tail rotor systems can be very folded to allow the aircraft to be moved into confined spaces. That, of course, is essential to enable it to fit into the hangars found on the ships. And if you look out of nature, when it's right in front of you, you'll see that it's right in front of the nose. There's a little tarpaulin, and then behind that is the main aircraft hangar. The aircraft's maximum weight is over 14 and a half tons. For an amazing top speed of 149 knots, it can carry sufficient fuel for a range of operation of over 200 nautical miles. Two versions are most uh, technologically advanced, that's the submarine and maritime control helicopter. 
bringing together the very best of defence industry suppliers, uh, led by Lockheed Martin, but with key contributions, unsurprisingly, from our very own uh, Augusta Western, CAE, Kinetic, Tarlis, and Sanix, and a whole range of medium-sized enterprises across the UK. And the Berlin there, just having recovered its crew member from the uh, simulated uh, deck investigation, doesn't overshoulder the departure, which is just, as you and I know, just uh, simply turning around, but actually it allows them to arrive in a certain direction and take off in the same direction, allowing for safety or tactical covert capability. Yes, um, you're seeing them in a very good light uh, today, uh, particularly uh, this gorgeous weather. More likely, uh, particularly in the search and rescue uh, world, these guys will be out in uh, huge great seas, generally on a January dark night, and the cloud and the wind are thrashing along. So uh, I imagine that all the Navy crews, whether they're embarked on the ship or in the air, is thoroughly enjoying the well. view of the underside of the, uh, the aircraft there with its uh, anti-surface warfare radar and just that disc underneath the chin of the aircraft. Now moving round into our crowd centre position and uh, what's called a quick stop position, quick, quick stop arrival. Very difficult to uh, spot the difference between a Mark 1 and a 2 and I'll be testing you all a little later in the weekend to see what the difference is but you have to look very very carefully indeed and I won't catch out my weak man here Andy um, because uh, I'm not sure he's up to speed with that yet either but it, um, it, all, the, uh, all the changes are primarily in size and uh, it's following a recent uh, very successful exercise called Deep Blue uh, that uh, Lockheed Martin really uh, brought the capabilities of the aircraft well into the 21st century. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here comes the bow, coming from 500 feet. A big package here and uh, all looking very unassuming Indeed, it's uh, got the capacity to absorb future requirements, multi-static sonics, future air to surface guiding weapons, all sorts of data things, an amazing amount of stuff which will uh, just keep us right on top of airborne surveillance and control uh, in the future with a thing codenamed Crozet. And as the, some of you may be aware, the Royal Air Force formerly flew the Merlin and uh, has now uh, passed over those aircraft as part of a sort of Ministry of Defence restructuring. And all RF Merlins are now going to the Royal Navy to be transported to the Royal Naval Rolls. And Royal Air Force will now stick with the Puma Mark II with its new upgrade and the Royal Air Force Chanute. But today now, in front of you now, towards this end of its display, Royal Navy Merlin. Yes, it's a great moment when he went to go and go to that red ice cream. Yeah, it's a huge wave on this guy, it's working very hard. Uh, very up in their spare time to uh, entertain and uh, enjoy the super weather. Brilliant stuff indeed. And uh, lots more of the Royal Navy to come over the next few days. Well, I have to display there in front of the uh, the Navy base there, Argus, Westminster, and the French Air Force, and indeed, uh, great to see there from the uh, fleet air on. Yes, of course, there is Royal Air Force, uh, Merlin, that are coming across from the involved in uh, other roles that the Royal Navy undertakes, uh, undertakes to the top, least of which is the trooping and pass roping for the Royal Marine Commandos as part of the Commando Helicopter Force. I believe they'll be replacing the Sea King that are surely just... And those the search and rescue. Yeah. Oh, hello. Somebody's playing some music for us, so goodness knows who that is, but uh, very nice of you to join us. Uh, nonetheless, uh, coming up now is something very different from... What Rolls-Royce and Spitfire, beautifully looked after by Rolls-Royce personnel. There's a uh, Papa Sierra 853 and is an unarmed high altitude reconnaissance aircraft under a batch of 79 Mark 19s built at Supermarine just up the road at Southampton. Powered by 2,000 horsepower Griffin 65 or the latest 66 and we represent that very pinnacle of the Spitfire's development that George mentioned earlier. So out to your front again, that wonderful uh, elliptical wing and the sound of that Griffin roar.
and the aircraft with the Battle of Britain Moor applied for the course an opportunity just to savour the sight and sound. Uh, the updated and uh, extended Mark 19 of course have carried that Griffin engine as uh, described, but uh, still the shape unmistakable and thin elliptical wing just thick enough to get to the all important uh, weapons and undercarriage in. And how sad that RJ Mitchell was not able to see the outrageous success of his aircraft and he of course dying far too young to see it through the combination. First of all, we have the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Dakota. there was a venerable workhorse in the aviation world, this is certainly right up at the top of the tree. Without doubt, one of the most successful aircraft designs in history. It became one of the world's most famous military transport aircraft and saw widespread use by the Allies during World War II and subsequently by Air Force's civilian operators worldwide. This aircraft bearing its uh, D-Day markings, of course, was intimately involved in the 70th anniversary celebrations just a few months ago and indeed I was just crawling it around it myself just a little while ago and its uh, latest inscription inside is from some of the veterans who dropped in again at those celebrations. C-47 is actually a military version of the DC-3 airliner it first flew in 1935 and was used extensively by America's airlines. It didn't take long, however, for the military to recognize its great potential. And it was the United States Army Air Command that firstly specified a number of changes needed to make the aircraft suitable for military use, including uh, more powerful engines, the replacement of the airline seating, and a stronger load-bearing floor. Well, almost the rest is history with this aircraft. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. The military version of the DC-3 designated the C-47 Skytrain. The race commenced in October 1941 and when production finally ended, an amazing 10,692 of these aircraft had been built. <laughs> Under the then lease program, something the youngsters may not be aware of, but uh, the Americans assisted the UK with supply of 2,000 of these aircraft. The Air Force uh, giving it the name Dakota, just uh, an acronym made out of the Douglas Aircraft Corporation's actual name. And uniquely it entered uh, Royal Air Force Service first of all in India, and that was in 1942. Totally revitalised the uh, transport positioning of the Royal Air Force. They were up to that stage using a number of obsolete bombers and general purpose aircraft with very poor adaptation to the role and the Dakota transformed the capability. Went on to equip 22 Royal Air Force Squadrons and three Royal Canadian Air Force Squadrons under operational control and they served in every theatre of the war, most notably in Burma, but also, of course, significantly during the D-Day landings and the airborne assault in Arnhem in 1944. 70th anniversary of that Operation Market Garden coming up in just a few weeks' time. It wasn't just in troop carrying and power dropping, of course, uh, transporting and flowing, towing gliders was also a major achievement and success of this aircraft. There, yeah, a whole, whole different story of success for the glider pilot. Today is uh, this iconic transport aircraft flown by modern day Royal Air Force counterparts and Royal Air Force transport pilots. We have uh, the lead captain today is uh, Seb Davy, a former Charlie 130 Hercules pilot. 
supported and helped by his uh, colleague navigator Dan Eaton and their crewman Lodi today is uh, Dino Hempelman. All of them served on the Charlie 130 Hercules transport aircraft. Zeb uh, trans uh, served throughout the world in the tactical airdrop role, led a lot of the development of work there. There's now the lead instructor on the tactical drop uh, unit, having served almost nine years on the 30 squadron. We're running into the right hand side now. The modern Royal Air Force counterparts training up to take over the Lancaster hopefully one day, find a Dakota counterpart. Um, is the modern Royal Air Force transport crew find this wonderful, iconic Dakota BBMF display transport aircraft. Yeah, it's a great sight indeed. The Dakota's amazing ruggedness became legendary. Please welcome the 2014 Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Identity representing a 617 squadron Lancaster B1, a Delta Victor 385, the Pumper Mark III. Very shortly after this pass, the formation will break and we'll be able to see each of the aircraft in their own special. undergoing the tail chase formation. So there are the two Spitfires now, 
coming up, demonstrating in very different shapes, uh, elliptical wing. The lead there is the Mark 16, Tango Echo 311, Mark 16 with the clipped wings and the bubble canopy, which I believe was specially modified for the latter war D Day low level scenario, whereas the Mark, Mark 9 again maximised for its air to air combat runs in the early, early mid part of the war. It was a plane with the wings to allow better visibility looking down and was built at Carson Bromwich just after the war had ended. This actual aircraft was then taken into by the Munster Registered by the Air Ministry in 1945 and delivered to a maintenance unit where from where it was pretty much placed immediately into storage. Up your left hand side now. And a pair of those wonderful engines. down the line by that beautiful Lancaster. Last, last pass for the Spitfires.
between 1941 and 1946. Of these, some 3,500 were lost on operations and another 200 or so were destroyed or ridden off in crashes. The vast majority of those Lancasters that didn't survive the war were simply scrapped when their services were no longer required. Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Lancaster runs in solo for the last opportunity before rejoining the fighters. Let us remember the 125,000 aircrew who actually served in Bomber Command during World War II. Over 73,700 of them became casualties, either killed, wounded or shot down or made prisoners of war. 55,753 of them died the Royal Air Force Service alone. And later in the weekend, when we see our Canadian compatriots, we will remember the Commonwealth contribution as well, which exceeded by another 55,000.
basic manoeuvres of air-to-air -air combat, where the aircraft is rolled one way and the pilot turns in the other, with the effect of trying to throw off and of pursuing opponents. Noel again, back in idle, slow down, and he comes back for the slow speed pass. Travelling at around 129 miles an hour, that's the kind of speed you'd expect from a very light aircraft. Not one that weighs over 16 tons. Noel, Noel is, uh, this is one of the only manoeuvres in the whole sequence that Noel can actually have a look down at the crowd, so please give him a big wave. Fire a wing over for the next manoeuvre. The aircraft there, believe it or not, weighs 13 and a half tons that it is now. 
So just remember that as he throws it around. So a wing over now to run into the roller coaster. I'm sure you've all been on roller coasters before, but I, I dare say not one like this. <laughs> carrying ten and a half tons underneath. It can uh, fit a great number of people in, inside. So up to around about 40, 45 people plus vehicles inside as well. Charlie repositioning once again via a wing over. And now Charlie's going to demonstrate a nose down 270 quick stop. This demonstrates the, aircraft, the way the aircraft can be stopped incredibly quickly uh, in combat situations. Uh, one of the uh, situations we might use this in is uh, during um, casualty evacuation uh, under fire. <laughs> As you can see, we're able to stop 13 and a half tons of spinning metal fairly quickly. You see the uh, ramp has come down now. Sergeant Andy Caldwell is uh, on the ramp, but he's got two very glow orange hands. He'll be waving at you all, so please wave back. You can see Charlie coming quite hard into the wind, which is strong there. Yeah, he's right. A big wave to Andy and the Further wing over to reposition, this time for the seesaw. We've been 
Zoomers made up of two opposed pedal turns, which is similar to wing overs, and something you saw earlier, the uh, Grand Fusion Back in 1956, part of the first the aircraft was exited 
Number five, make
right there, the wonderful view there, the aircraft fighting the wind there, the drift is flying in uh, these windy conditions. The aircraft, as Bill and George mentioned, was still just right at the end of the second one, but didn't quite see more service. Eventually converted to training purposes, then served as a research test bed, before then being formed by France to fire by their French mapping service, and served as a, a mapping aircraft throughout Europe. Back in 1975, uh, Ted White, a businessman, brought the aircraft, renaming it from its French designation to the Imperial War Museum of Duxford, renaming it N17 DE, March 1975, to begin its new life as Sally B, named after Ted's long time companion, Ellie Sally B. Losses, and they just only play like it's always usually the IS routes at night time raids. 
the end after the became famous for the to turn and the train and himself the aircraft a terrible battle I think but safely kicking him to the road. Um, Bond respect and love by the able to fly her crew to traffic significant damage to the German defence. Wonderful view here, that beautiful long white wing, smooth now, wonderful crowd front pass, the race was done.
16 and a half pounds a pound of static thrust from each of them, about 65 pounds a pound total. And you also heard there the bump and howl, the unique sound, lovely blue note, the sound of the howl from the bump and the sway those engines are very deep inside the air intakes and front swing. I noticed that uh, Kev has put the undercarriage down now. Anything, but uh, just uh, we see her with the wheels down, and you'll do a certified last. All 18 wheels extended, 16 uh, in the main undercarriage, and two of the nose wheels. Interestingly, I said that um, 1952 was the maiden flight of the Actually, exactly 62 years ago today. Absolutely magnificent. Did you enjoy that? Wow! 
Now, as they fly back towards us, we dedicate this next move that the play is going to form the brave new who called to the Battle of Britain. It is the Spitfire Roll.
Well, those of you keen on aviation photographic shots, you can see now this unique formation going into line astern. They'll come through straight over, oh, perhaps between the two ships, which would be just the superb, straight in towards the Cumberland Hotel for the Heritage Bomb Burst.
achieved its above average qualification as an instructor and returned to Canberra flying instructional duties with 231 OCU and then training officer with 100 squadron of the